needed to introduce the next speaker. I was so thrilled hanging out with those guys. Um, well, so they were alluding to the people in this room, and um, we very specifically asked our next speaker to speak because she was one of the loudest voices uh, in the Sopa Pippa battle, and we're very glad and very happy to offer you Leslie Harris, the president of CDT. I'm usually accused of having a soft voice. Um, thank you, Mika. Thank you, Andrew. Um, it's a wonderful introduction. Thank you for your leadership and your vision. It's been important to all of us. Uh, I'm less sure that I should be thanking them for putting me up on the stage following the senators, who I also refer to as our most recently anointed internet deities. Um, it's a bit like having the midnight show after the Daily Show and uh, on Comedy Central and then Colbert. Does, does anybody know who's on Comedy Central at midnight? <laughs> uh, see, I thought it was reruns of Reno 9-11, and so. Um, so here's a story, and, and maybe you've heard it before. The Internet's threatened by a sweeping censorship bill. It's aimed at reining in the growing threat to the American way of life. The threat? The internet. The community rises up in protest. Phone calls, notice I only say phone calls. Phone calls flood into the Capitol. But armed with a collective moral panic, the bill passes with only a few dissenting votes. What happens next? Internet users take to the digital streets. There is a blackout, and 2,500 sites go dark. If you're under 30, you're saying, what? <laughs> Companies then join with advocates, sounds a little SOPA-like, uh, to challenge this bill. Goes to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court provides the highest level of constitutional protection to speech online. And the court also leaves in place this little unnoticed provision called Section 230. It's the provision that basically shields all the Internet's intermediaries, ISPs, new applications, from any liability for the speech of their users. And I don't know if Senator Wyden has left the House, but we have him to thank for that as well. So the internet revels in its new power. Of course, the year was 1996, uh, and the bill was the Communications Decency Act. So why look back? To make two points. Uh, the first is that advocacy has always mattered for the open internet. I'm going to say this twice. And second, that it takes more than a moment to make a movement. The defeat of the CDA was a seminal moment in the development of the Internet. And I'm proud of the role C CDT played, but it didn't launch a movement. And the years between the CDA and SOPA were marked by many, many such important moments for the open Internet. <coughs> And they were backed by powerful coalitions that many of you participated in. But it is fair to say that they also did not lead to a sustained movement for the open Internet. It may be too soon to fully understand whether the SOPA moment will become the sustained movement that we are all waiting for. And I think the full implications of the SOPA tsunami will be revealed over the co co uh, course of years, not months or days. I give up. I'm putting the glasses back on. <laughs> it's 145 days since the Internet stood still and SOPA imploded. And yet Washington has not learned very much. The dominant meme remains unchanged. We, 
are an unruly mob of pirates or pawns or victims of a misinformation campaign and led off a cliff like lemmings by Google. I've come to think that this meme is strategic, that they know better, but that what we have done will be diminished and disempowered if the meme prevails. In fact, one House staffer, how, what did I say it was, 145 days? Recently in, well, I beg to differ as well. The campaign against SOPA was not a tactic, and we as internet users and leaders are certainly not astroturf. Congress can't stop reading from the same dog-eared script, and it speaks volumes about how they continue to see the world. It kind of goes like this. There's a bill. One party supports the bill. The other party opposes the bill. Companies get lined up behind one side or the other. And each side has its set of owned and operated front groups in its service. The SOPA uprising so disrupted this well-worn narrative that they just can't make sense of it. But you know what? I think we're just beginning to get a better understanding of SOPA and the forces we collectively unleashed. <clears throat> yes, first narratives have emerged. Heroes have been anointed. Reddit and the lolcats have been saved. But it's really too soon to write the final history of the SOPA uprising. We don't yet know what we don't yet know. And to the extent we think we do, I think we're own all hobbled by our own perspectives. It reminds me of the ancient tale of the six blind men and the elephant. All the men are asked to touch this elephant, and one touches the leg and claims it's a column. Another, the tail, declares that it's a rope, and yet another holds the trunk and he's convinced it's a tree. Everyone's right. Everyone's absolutely wrong. Yes, something profound happened during the SOPA uprising, but if we're going to get from a moment to a movement, our first task must be to knit together into a common narrative our stories in, so that we will have a richer and, importantly, more inclusive whole. We need to view ourselves as a collective startup with a wealth of energy and a powerful idea, build an advocacy movement to defend the open Internet, but we need to give ourselves space to innovate, to experiment, and to evolve. We have to figure out how to meld together our skills, our strategies, in the service of the common goal. And in that regard, I'd like to get rid of the inside Washington, outside Washington meme while we're kicking things to the curb. And we need to form and test new partnerships, build our collective knowledge, and most importantly, deepen our trust in each other. Each new challenge is a beta. We try out, we refine our strategies, and then we move closer to the movement that we want to be. But whatever we think we've accomplished, we will understand much more over time. I do know this. SOPA shook Congress to its core. It left members looking over their shoulders, fearful of getting SOPA'd and asking, what will the Internet do? Reminds me. I, I, I wondered if we should go back to those bracelets. Um, the answer has not been long in coming. ACTA is on the rocks in Europe. <laughs> And the future of CISPA is in doubt. And even as many of our corporate allies lined up in support of that bill, and many others stood on the sidelines, the internet community succeeded in putting privacy at the center of the cybersecurity debate. We deprived the proponents of enough votes to overcome a threatened veto. In the and as Senator Wyden noticed, 
substantial privacy changes are now in the works in the Senate. So what's next? It's not too soon to ask, what do we want to be when we grow up? Is our purpose to be defenders of the internet against a reckless and feckless Congress? Just love the word feckless. <laughs> Keep wondering if people who aren't feckless are full of feck. Um, <laughs> You know, we really have no choice. Even as copyright has been swept off the table, at least for the near future, there is so much more in the wings. Data retention mandates, surveillance technology mandates, that's telling the new applications that are being launched that they have to redo their technology to make it possible for the government to surveil. Lots of different monitoring and gatekeeping obligations. It's not just copyright that leads many, many, many interests to trying to grab and undo the openness of the internet. And of course, depending on the outcome of the election, it's possible that we will even be dealing with the repeal of net neutrality. But does it have to always be this way? Can we envision a time when the open internet becomes an issue at the ballot box? when candidates scramble to take a pledge, I've been trying to imagine whether I'm talking about a Grover Norquist type pledge, it's getting kind of attractive, uh, to protect the internet, maybe it's the Bill of Rights we've been speaking about this morning, and then they proudly tout their internet freedom record. It would be nice, to quote Andrew, if more than two people in Congress at any one time knew the difference between a waiter and a server. The green shoots of democracy are already emerging. Just head to Austin and check out these really cool crowdsourced, don't mess with the internet billboards that are all over Lamar Smith's district. Or go to Europe where the Pirate Party is enjoying growing support. But my hope is that we can resist the temptation to just do nerd politics. We just can't talk to ourselves and others in the know. We can't simply disdain traditional politics. And after a conversation this morning, I'm going to say, and we have to have a politics that's wel more welcoming to women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nerd girls. <laughs> we have to grab our passports, leave the comfort of the Republic of Nerdistan, and seek to develop a more inclusive internet politics. Can we use those nerd skills to develop a more inclusive internet politics? Can we use them to take on, disrupt, and reshape traditional politics and help empower ordinary people to reclaim democracy? I think we can. It's a long journey, but I think we can. But first, we do have to set out a positive vision for the internet, maybe it is the Bill of Rights we were talking about this morning. And then an agenda that captures the imagination of the electorate. One that they can envision themselves and their future and the future of their children. Here comes the hard part. That means sometimes we have to get beyond no. I like no. I'm a civil liberties lawyer. I've spent the better part of my career in creative ways of saying no. And no is safe, and it's easy to organize around, and it keeps us united. No was the right strategy for SOFA. But no cannot be the sole basis for a lasting movement, certainly not one that is going to attain political power. We have to be prepared to grapple with the issues that affect all internet users and be willing to entertain the possibility, I hope I don't have to write anything else, that, the an that sometimes the answers are simply not going to be as easy as hands off. We can and should use our collective knowledge and skills to find better answers to real problems and that respect the internet's openness and protect our rights. And we must articulate a common set of ethics for the internet community and be willing to step up and call out those who step out of line. 
if we want to keep the government out and invite the American people in, we have to state our values and then we need to live by them. We also need to work out our place in the global movement for internet freedom. What happens in the United States matters to the freedom of internet users all over the world. And when we stumble, internet freedom stumbles everywhere. As one prominent internet advocate from India put it quite well, the world is waiting to cherry pick from America's worst practices. The three million people from around the world that joined our fight against SOPA were not lending a helping hand. They were fighting for their freedoms. We should fight for their freedoms as well. Finally, a thought about money. Let's not squander the opportunity to build a powerful movement because of lack of resources. Please don't force us to play the Hunger Games. Our startups need investment to help nurture online groups, give us all room to be more entrepreneurial, to build new collaborations, and yes, occasionally to fail. There simply has to be more money on the table, and not just from foundations but also from the investors, the entrepreneurs, and the innovators who have become a critical part of the Internet's new power politics. SOPA should be a wake-up call. Internet advocacy matters. It protects what you do every day. Innovate without permission, and it deserves your support. So, let's celebrate our moment and then get down to the hard work of building it into a lasting movement for internet freedom. Let's erect a big tent. Let's set a welcoming table. Let's try out some bold ideas. And let's be kind to each other and learn to celebrate our differences. It makes us stronger. It increases the chances for success. And it makes the journey between a moment and a movement a lot more fun. Thank you.